thank you so much everyone for coming out to this event. This is my first attempt for an international event. I am Canadian and usually my events are in Toronto. So I was so excited that this event was sold out. Thank you so much to everyone who has supported this event. Uh, I would not have been able to do this without you, so thank you. And I'll just get started with my first question because I think it's interesting to get some uh, feedback from my panelists because there are a lot of different ideas about this topic. And the question is, what does green beauty mean to you? And maybe we'll get started with Laura. You've got a little bit of a, a preview with me earlier. So what does green beauty mean to you? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess green beauty means to me looking at a product's entire life cycle from conception and looking at how ingredients are sourced and how they're grown and all of the impacts that go into making those ingredients. So, you know, pesticide use, harvesting, etc., all the way to kind of end of life impacts with packaging and anything else that'll end up in waterways. So obviously, very similar to what I would probably say for, for the question. I focus a lot in what I do on the stuff in between, the creating the molecules and uh, making sure that we're trying to improve uh, bio-based content, looking at environmental footprint of the uh, feedstocks. And, and so that part of uh, Green Beauty, I think, is sometimes overlooked. We look towards trying to use natural ingredients, but sometimes uh, not really assessing environment, environmental impact of taking those natural ingredients from the environment. I see green, green beauty as mostly a marketing position and companies in the cosmetic space have a wide range of what they consider as green beauty, anywhere from the way it started as just greenwashing, where you take regular products and throw in some extracts and now you're green, uh, to people who are actually making an, eff an effort to have minimal impact on the environment and uh, using renewable resources and such. And f where we stand in the market on that, I think we're still more on the greenwashing side, but we're getting, we're moving better to the uh, the other side, which is ultimately, I think, where we should be uh, for green beauty and, and natural products. For me, quite simply, green is is good. Uh, I focus at the beginning of the life cycle, the origin, the birth of compounds and molecules. But uh, if it wasn't for a term like green, it'd be so easy to think about what I do in that context alone. So green being somewhat of an undefined, almost uh, abstract word forces me to think outside of that box about the entire picture, the entire life cycle. And I like that, uh, I like that element of green. And for me, I think green beauty is something that is really hard to define even for myself. I think there's a huge spectrum in what brands and consumers consider green as well as what companies are what they're limited by and how they can kind of act on being environmental in every single way. I definitely do believe in that full life cycle of a product from conception to, you know, where does that bottle go at the end of the day and is that contributing anything good to the environment um, or just to the world in general. But I think it is kind of a hard to define word at this time and um, there's a huge spectrum. So if you're sourcing your ingredients and they're very sustainable, well, what does your packaging process look like? What are your logistics? How many places are you sourcing your ingredients from? You know, how, how much shipping and traveling has to go that through that? And then also, where are your consumers? Are they local? Are they international? And what kind of, you know, packaging goes into that? So I think, for me, it's just something that I can't really define. I think it's a good goal to be sustainable and consider the environment and do the best you can. But I wouldn't be able to put, you know, a checklist of all these things that you need to do to be a green beauty brand. And I think a really big challenge right now in the industry and also across sectors is we don't have a unified understanding of what sustainability or green mean. And so you've just heard a lot of different definitions, but they are from scientists. And I can assure you that a lot of people have very different <laughs> opinions about what uh, green means. And so I think 
as an industry, we should probably be unified with a way that we describe green and probably sustainability might be a better way to look at it. And so I usually on these panels have my friend Dana Stein. She couldn't make it to this panel, but she is a sustainability expert and she's great with defining the term. So I will just try to uh, say it to the best of uh, the best that I can, which I will look at the nat uh, natural step uh, definition framework of sustainability. To me, this is the most scientific way of looking at <coughs> sustainability. So bear with me, I will be reading right from my uh, uh, notes, but the natural step framework is based on scientific principles and incorporates the wider environment, social economic system. In a sustainable society, nature is not subject to systematically increasing one, concentrations of substances extracted from the Earth's crust, two, concentrations of substances produced by society, and three, degradation by physical means, and in that society, four, human needs are met. And so this framework provides metrics for companies and society to strive for. So to me, that would be a great framework for more industries and probably society to start to look at. And now from your vantage point, what are some of the biggest challenges, sustainability challenges, that we face in the cosmetics industry? And I'll start with you, Kenna. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges come down to, well, I mean, there's definitely a ton, but one that really sticks out in my mind is packaging, um, not only shipping packaging, but also on the manufacturing side. Every time you receive, even if it's glass bottles, they're packed in bubble wrap and plastic and a lot of different packing materials. So even if you think that your end consumer product is sustainable or you know eco-friendly because it's glass, well, the life, life cycle of that product was maybe not so sustainable because it had to be packed in foam peanuts or bubble wrap or what have you. So for me, I think, um, I think packaging is a huge challenge that we face. The second one I definitely see being um, this whole desire for very exotic and almost kind of endangered plant material. There used to be this huge belief that if something was very exotic and you know hard to come by and um, very out of your own kind of area that meant it was this magical potion and that did lead to a lot of plants becoming endangered because of over harvesting and things like that so I think reducing the glamorization of kind of exotic and very rare plants would also be helpful for maintaining um, healthy ecosystems and those kind of endangered species as well. So those are my top two, I'd say. If we were to continue in a linear progression, um, I spend a lot of time dealing with big companies. And so I think one of the things that frustrates me most is big companies, whilst they have that potential to create really, really big impact when they make a change towards sustainability, I feel so much energy is put towards the image of sustainability rather than necessarily the transition of in companies I talked to when I was just at a conference this last week, the uh, ACI conference in, in Orlando, and quite a number of people around those social hours would talk about the problems with sustainability. And they would nitpick on why this particular solution is imperfect, or why that particular solution won't work in these types of conditions. And it's a little frustrating as an innovator because we know the first step we do in something will be imperfect but it's always about a journey and not a particular solution. And so it becomes easy, I think, for the entrenched players to look at what you're bringing to the table as new compared to what they've had decades or even centuries to become entrenched and then point out the imperfections rather than try and enable the resolution or the solution of some of those, uh, those imperfections. So I find that as a big frustration. Perhaps it's the nature of disruption that there will always be objections from the entrenched instead of enablement. I think there are really two uh, significant challenges to sustainability. Uh, from a formulator standpoint, the number one problem is that consumers are used to products that work how they are working now. And when you're switching to some sustainable or new material, uh, they just don't work as well. Um, the reality is that the products that we've developed now are at the level that they're at over time. If there was some natural ingredient that made products work better, we would be using that already. So a switch to something that's 
petroleum-free, more sustainable, is necessarily going to make products that consumers don't like as much. That's the biggest challenge of sustainability. Second only to the even bigger challenge of sustainability is that we're in a capitalistic society and we want consumers to use more and more products. And more and more just does not, it's not uh, coincide well with being sustainable. So to develop a system, uh, Jen talked about the, the, I think the last statement in the sustainability motto was what consumers need. We're in the business of providing them more than what they need. And we have to grow our businesses. And to be sustainable and always have continued growth is a real challenge. I think in terms of the uh, product performance, you know, that piece of it, uh, you know, the products that we had now are using chemicals that were developed, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago. And we have uh, a long legacy of uh, product developers who have brought us to this, you know, kind of state in terms of product performance. And that creates the expectation that as we try to move to more sustainable ingredients, uh, we have to re-educate formulators, ourselves as formulators, you know, how to uh, make these products uh, work uh, the way we want them to in formulation. It's, it's not an easy journey. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, it's a good thing for formulators. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> it keeps them busy. The, the problem, though, is that we're spending time just making just trying to do things that we've already done just in a different way. Right. We're not making products better. Right. That's the, pro that's the challenge of sustainability. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, making that shift, you know, to a new approach to using more sustainable ingredients. So a lot of times it's a new mindset. It has to create a, a new way of thinking about product forms and product performance. You know, the other thing in terms of challenges to sustainability is, um, you know, I, I kind of, you know, Taking this out of just an experience today, I was here in California, didn't uh, have much to do during the day today, so I went to the uh, La Brea Tar Pits and uh, stood where, you know, there's basically oil coming out of the ground below your feet. And it makes you kind of feel how maybe in a way we had come to a place where we felt like this is a limitless resource that was there for us to manipulate and use to our advantage. Uh, but we know that it's, uh, first, it's not a limitless resource, and secondly, that that uh, taking that resource uh, and, and putting it uh, back into the environment is, is not good for the environment. And so um, that has been the instinct in, in terms of you know, product development uh, to manufacture, to design molecules uh, using those things. And um, you know, what uh, Genomatic is doing uh, is a, a really a new and innovative way to design molecules and uh, you know, applaud them for, for moving that forward. Yeah, I think we're perhaps uh, describing a shortcoming if we think sustainability is trapped within a box of only ever bringing us products that are inferior to what we're working with or don't perform as well as what we're working with because there's two beautiful parts of biology. One of being able to switch the way we make things to make the exact same things we use so we're not compromising on performance or even looking to biology for what it does better than what we can do in chemistry, bio-inspired materials. Bio-inspired products can sometimes give us solutions we never even imagined possible, as long as we're not sort of trapped in that box of thinking, well, if it's sustainable, therefore I have a problem, I'm gonna to have to struggle to deal with it because that's perhaps been some of my experiences, but I would argue it's not the totality of experiences in, in bio-inspired or in bio-based. And I don't think that's inherently a problem. I, I think new molecules can create products that work better, uh, but often that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I would say the biggest challenge from my purview would probably be misinformation. So I think it's very common to have like bigger companies who see consumer demand switch towards something like claiming ingredients are all natural and some things you know, 100% chemical free, which we know doesn't exist. Um, so <laughs> you kind of have this switch toward trying to please the consumer instead of please, you know, the sustainability aspects um, of whatever product you're looking at and making a lot of false claims or going towards something because, you know, people will want to buy that and you want to like make the product look nice and presentable and 
there's a lot of misinformation campaigns out there, um, and there's just a lot of false information that floats around in like the cosmetic space, um, and even about like plastics and plastic packaging and the life cycle associated with that and microplastics. There's just so much surrounding that that it's all you know plastic is evil, but it's really how we look at the material and how we use it that's the most important. And I just want to echo that because to me, I think misinformation is also the biggest challenge that we face in the cosmetics industry, not just with sustainability across the board, but with sustainability. There are so many different NGOs out there that align themselves with sustainability. There is one big one in the States. You probably know who it is if you don't. I mean, Google, environmental <laughs> and cosmetics. It'll probably come right up. Uh, I would just be critical of it because it's not always based on science and largely it's not and usually they're, they're, they're framing it from fallacies. This thing is natural and so it must be better. And it's just not always the case. Sometimes natural is detrimental to the environment if it's coming from endangered species or if it needs a lot of plant material or if it's... I mean, it might even be a toxicant to us. So I mean, it's just not that cut and dry. And I think a lot of the times that's what some of the misinformation leads consumers to believe. And I think a really big challenge for this is because sometimes this misinformation leads to regulations taking action that aren't always based on science. And there are a number of things coming up in the States right now uh, that I personally feel is uh, basing some of the changes from misinformation, and I don't know if it's going to make things better, but Dennis, this question is for you. What are your thoughts on some of the latest regulatory changes, and will they actually make products more sustainable, and also maybe if you were to change regulations to improve the sustainability profile of our industry, how would you change regulations. Right. In, in terms of improving, you know, sustainability and thinking about sustainability more holistically, especially with regard to product safety, uh, I would definitely, you know, look towards, you know, a big infusion of uh, money towards independent uh, testing of uh, ingredients and products uh, to uh, do better safety assessment. A lot of this testing is done, you know, by us in the industry as manufacturers, and there's a tendency for consumers to not trust the manufacturers of the ingredients to provide, you know, honest or, or uh, accurate information regarding uh, product safety. So if we had you know, some sort of a testing body that was completely independent uh, of the industry uh, as a uh, kind of third party driving uh, testing and verification of uh, product and ingredient safety. I think that would be a, a great solution. You know, there are a lot of legislations bandied about and sometimes you try not to react to them too soon, but then uh, sometimes if you uh, wait too long, then, then they come into fruition. And a big challenge uh, for the industry in terms of compliance uh, with new regulations is going to be the, you know, the dioxane law in New York. I, I think the um, cosmetics industry is maybe a little bit better at, at being ahead of that and had already taken out uh, a lot of ethoxylated ingredients from formulations and in a lot of cases where they hadn't, you know, I, I think probably people are already thinking about uh, solutions. Certain things are going to be uh, fairly challenging uh, to, to take out to, to meet the, you know, restrictions uh, that were uh, put forth there. And um, I see the doxing issues being probably mostly impacting or having the greatest impact against uh, sustainability in like laundry and home care uh, because all of our ADEX, you know, laundry detergents and things like that are built around and non-ionic surfactants that are ethoxylated. There uh, was a lot of uh, effort, you know, amongst uh, uh, industry uh, to uh, try to illustrate that the uh, 
you know, New York has, you know, a groundwater issue with dioxane, uh, but it wasn't because of, you know, uh, household or cosmetic or laundry products. It was because of different types of manufacturing that was happening there, you know, many years ago. Um, even by presenting, you know, groundwater data from elsewhere in the country uh, to show that, you know, this is a problem that was unique uh, to Long Island, Long Island Sound, uh, because of the manufacturing there it was, you know, insufficient to, to sway regulators. Long makers in, in uh, New York to uh, reassess what, what they were doing there. And so, um, yeah, I think it's uh, going to be a challenge for, for our industry. I think it's going to be especially a, a challenge for some other industries, which we're making strides towards uh, making more concentrated uh, products to, to reduce environmental impact. Especially when the regulations aren't necessarily science-based, but they're more uh, based on the fears of people who don't base their decisions on science. And I would just add to a point that you brought up that uh, we need like independent scientists. So something alarming came up on my social media. If you're not following me already, I'm on Instagram at the EcoL. But something on Instagram alarms me where somebody just wasn't trusting one of my colleagues for the information that she put out, which was accurate, because she was a cosmetic scientist. And somehow, because she is aligned with the, the way that this person phrased it, the industry that's uh, poisoning us, then she's not going to be uh, providing accurate information. Uh, yeah, so I can assure you that that's like, not the case. No one's like behind your products with the intention to kill you and a lot of the scientists like want to put out accurate information it's, and it's kind of important for our industry that our customers stay alive and healthy so. yeah. <laughs> and also might i just add when when regulations change like consumers think that us like chemists are going to be upset about this. This is actually like good for our job security because it means that we're going to have to reformulate and then that's us <laughs> getting paid. So uh, I'll just, I mean, leave that with you. I think the, the thing that regulation hurts the most yeah. are small innovative companies. Uh, for, for consumers, maybe it's good that people can't mix a, a batch of uh, a facial mask in their kitchen and then sell it on Etsy. I, I don't know, maybe that's maybe we don't want that. Uh, but you'll see a lot less brands being able to launch independently. Big companies don't mind regulations. They help write them and they've already got pe plenty of people on staff to do more testing. It's not a problem for big companies. And just going along the lines of misinformation, and I brought this up already, that a common misconception among consumers is that natural is green, and so Keta. Is natural synonymous with sustainable or green? Definitely not. I love this topic. Um, I think, and I am definitely guilty of this as well, when I was first starting out making my own products um, as a young teen, I thought that sustainable products were made with only plant-based ingredients and that was, you know, kind of the be all end all of what sustainable products should be and that's really the farthest thing from the truth. Um, it takes a lot more resources, land, water, um, labor and transportation to create an energy to create uh, plant-based extracts and products than it does synthetic ingredients. I mean, Synthetic ingredients can be made in a very small lab 24-7 with absolutely, basically no input um, besides, you know, a little bit. And it just does not compare to the amount of resources needed to produce plant-based materials. Um, in addition, there's a lot of harmful uh, harvesting practices with plant material. Um, a good example is licorice extract, which is really popular in both the natural health product and cosmetic space. I mean, they basically plant it in um, large quantities and then just bulldoze it up and then that land cannot be used for several years because it completely depletes the soil. So it's not a very sustainable way of producing that raw material and it does lead to other really important staple food crops and just ecosystems to be destroyed. So I think it's 
It's easy to think that a natural product is sustainable, but often it's the synthetic ones that are going to be more sustainable long term. Um, going along the theme of fear, I think it's another huge uh, limitation in the industry for progress of sustainable materials when we look at things like genetically modified organisms. I think when anyone hears like, oh, you're changing the DNA of something, we all think back to those like glow in the dark fish and monkeys that like freaked everyone out a long time ago. Well, long time ago for me. And, um, <laughs> and then we get kind of freaked out about this idea of changing DNA when really it's, I think that's the future of sustainable ingredients. I think that if we can use these incredible bacteria that we modify with the knowledge that we're gaining every single day about what enzymes we need from different plants to actually produce these um, in a lab setting, you know, in big tanks with bacteria that do require very minimal input. Um, I think that is something that's really going to drive the sustainable ingredients forward. And then we don't have to use hundreds of acres of uh, land that should be actually used for food. I think that thinking, you know, we need to be planting plants for cosmetics to make ourselves beautiful is a little bit selfish and we should be thinking more holistically about how we're using our land and all of our resources that way. And maybe just to add to this, in 2018, there was two published studies in Nature and then there was a UN report just last year talking about this that a lot of the times, instead of converting our land to agricultural purposes, it's better to just leave it alone. And so that's something to think about if we're converting land to be used to produce ingredients for the cosmetics industry. If somebody's saying that that's sustainable, I would personally question that. Does anyone want to add to that? Well, and you're also taking land away that could be used for growing food. We haven't solved world hunger yet. So we don't have like extra land to be using for a lot of these cosmetic ingredients. And so I'm encouraged to see uh, a lot of fermentation ingredients come around where you can, you don't need land for that. You can put it in a vat and uh, let the yeast grow it, you know. Well, let, um, me, let me step into that because we actually do use a lot of land. Oh, well, I did not know. <laughs> right, because those vats and those microorganisms are fueled by sugar. Uh, and we have to get that sugar from somewhere. And so where do we get it from? We get it from crops mm -hmm. that are grown to, to, produce that, to produce that sugar. And I think we, we look at this subject of, of world hunger not as a sort of a macro issue that it's kind of floating above all of us um, because there are parts of the world where we have an abundance of food. Heck, who's going out to dinner tonight, right? There's no shortage of food here. We have a distribution issue when it comes to, to the availability of staple crops and staple products for uh, food and for world hunger, I believe. But when we grow plants, that's something we can do indefinitely. It's replenishable, unlike what we take out of the crust. If you go back to one of your principles of sustainability, we can replant because they're fueled by the sun. You know, carbon dioxide goes through this cycle. And the great thing I think about using plants in this context is they become an enormous sink for carbon dioxide. In fact, the more sugar we use, the more plants we grow, the more green we put on this planet, the more CO2 we take out of the atmosphere, which because of unsustainable practices in the past, somehow we've managed to spike those levels up to a really unsafe and unsustainable uh, manner. So yes, bacteria do grow in tanks. That in itself is small and concentrated. And compared to cracking natfa and fluing oil, you know, it's a very contained, safe, easy to run process. But don't forget that we still do draw upon the land. And we can't ignore that because if we do, we may fall into the trap of bad land management practices. So. Before when I say, what does green do for me? It forces me to think outside of where I am. Because one of the things we ask the question of is to our suppliers of sugar, where is it coming from? You know, what are your fertilization techniques? How are you managing water? Um, how are you managing uh, your relationships with rural communities? And those become bigger questions that we have to try and draw upon because we would be foolish, foolish not to. It does concern me though, as we go to population 9 billion, we're, we're going to need more land to feed people. Um, and I think it's, it's a real concern with sustainability and using that land for cosmetic ingredients doesn't seem like a great idea. And might I just add, don't be disillusioned to think that natural ingredients don't require petrochemicals. 
because how much petroleum is used to fuel the tractors yeah. and whatever trucks are used to transport them and then whatever vessels are used to extract the ingredients and produce something viable. So, I mean, there's obviously a lot to think about when you're talking about a sustainable ingredient, but it's a lot more complex than just this is natural and so this is green and maybe just a call to action. If you hear brands saying this, because I think a lot of the times they don't know and I don't think that a lot of consumers are aware that most indie brands are consumers themselves and they just don't know. And so I think that there is a lot of power just to starting these conversations and having them with brands because if you start to talk to them about this, then maybe then they'll think differently about some of these topics. But then moving past this, Laura, do you think the industry's push to reduce or remove plastic from packaging is a positive step, either environmentally or otherwise? Um, I think it's definitely a mixed bag. I think it's prompted a lot of innovation. So a lot of people are looking for alternatives, either you know bio-based plastic or biodegradable plastic. Um, but then there's also some downsides for sure. So if you look at glass as an example of something that people could use instead of plastic, it's a lot heavier. So if you're shipping that, you're gonna emit a lot more carbon because the trucks are weighed down. So there's that whole aspect of how much does it weigh? And then can you even recycle it? So I know in my county where I live in New York, the glass goes to the recycling plant, but it's not actually made into a new product. It's used as landfill cover. And that's pretty typical for a lot of places in the US, especially because glass on the conveyor belt will typically break and it'll just go down and become part of the kind of contaminated spread that's going along the conveyor belt. And so you can use that to cover a landfill, but you can't take that glass out and make it into a product again. So I think there's a lot of complicated aspects to the plastic issue, um, especially with you know refilling a product how are you going to do that? And if it's local, maybe that's possible, but is that not possible near you because that brand isn't near you? I mean, it gets so complicated, especially with some of the misnomers with bio-based versus biodegradable. So just because a plastic or a product is bio-based doesn't mean that it'll actually biodegrade in the environment. So unless they've done the testing to show like that product at that size will actually biodegrade, um, it might not, so particle size can drastically change how something's gonna degrade in the environment. So I think there's a lot of innovation, but there's still like a really big way to go as far as packaging. And I, I just want another opinion from you just along this topic. In Canada, I don't know what you guys have in the United States, I'm sorry for my ignorance, but we have a lot of products that are claiming that their plastic is compostable and then it doesn't actually work out once it gets to the municipal waste management systems because there didn't seem to be great collaboration between industry to waste management. Could you chime in on that point? Yeah, that's a huge issue. So there's first like a big packaging issue that a lot of bio-based plastics um, aren't all compostable. So sometimes they don't say that it's compostable, but they'll have like, oh, this is you know partially recycled plastic. So they'll put like a big green leaf on it because that's supposed to mean it's better. Um, <laughs> but then people will put that into you know their compost collection thinking, oh, it has the big green leaf. So that means that it's compostable. Um, so a lot of compost facilities are dealing with this huge increase in contamination with an increase in compostable and bio-based plastics. Um, and they have to either you know, deal with that contamination on their end or just say no, like don't send it to us. So some places have decided to just say no, we're not gonna take any. And there's the other issue of sending it to the composting facility and potentially it will take too long for their turnover. So I think sometimes it takes like a couple of months because it has to be at really high temperatures within the middle of the compost. Um, so if that facility turns over too fast and they can't have it be sitting in there long enough, they'll just form microplastics and it won't break down anyway. So some places won't take it for that reason. Um, but if they do ultimately accept it, there's still like the issue of how much are they taking in and can they handle that amount of intake. 
and is there even a compost facility near you? So a lot of places there isn't even an industrial compost that you can bring this to. So some people put it in their home compost, but that doesn't reach adequate temperatures of you know 100 degrees or more to be able to break that down fully. So, yeah. And maybe just to add, I'm sorry for continuing to pester you. I've seen a lot of packaging changes where, I mean, it seems like it's a good idea where they have cardboard packaging, but then it's lined with plastic. And then I talked to my local municipal waste management system about this, and they're like, well, we can't even process this because this is now so complex. We don't know what to do with this. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a big issue, especially the change to potentially use less plastic in a product. So a lot of places will also just say, we're gonna be using you know, 60% less plastic, but then it becomes this really thin plastic that the facility can no longer recycle. So it's like, how much better is that if the end of life is still kind of this question mark? Um, and then there's the other issue of mixed packaging. So it's the cardboard with the plastic, or you know the plastic with another different type of plastic, which both have to be separated, and if they can't be separated, then you can't properly recycle it. So it usually just ends up either going to an incinerator, like where I live, or just going into a landfill or the trash. Now moving on, but the next question is for you, Damien. What are, because I know you've experienced quite a few, some of the challenges with uh, current in industry eco-certifications? Mm -hmm. So, not entirely sure what the question is, Jen, but maybe you've presented the subject and I can just like <laughs> spring into it and see so where we say, go. <laughs> so say like, the current eco-certifications that I see, sorry for not being super clear, <laughs> uh, like I see eco-cert, Cosmos, uh, some people might say USDA a organic, or uh, I mean, there are a lot of other uh, certifications out there, but I'd say that they are the bigger parties. What are some of the challenges for businesses and industry for that? Uh, I know you have personally, with Genomatica, experienced quite a few challenges with getting your products certified. What do you think about these challenges that they have presented to you and like are they actually like certifying green or are they just like certifying this arbitrary, I've just obviously given my thoughts but <laughs> what do you think? Perhaps, perhaps somewhere in this conversation there is someone who's certifiable but uh, to, not you Jen, to be very clear. Um, so, I think one of the chief challenges of being an innovator is you're turning up on the scene with a set of ideas that are new, um, that people are not all that familiar with. And then the challenge in talking to certifying bodies is they tend to operate from a set of principles that are based on what's known. So already we're talking in two different languages quite, quite frequently. Um, I think the great thing about certifying bodies is they're able to distill complex information down to a set of reliable, trustworthy brands or messages that consumers recognize, and it's a way to help consumers make the type of change that they are, they're looking for, whether it be organic labeling on food, or if you get into uh, cosmetics, and particularly in Europe strongly, we see the Cosmos label or EcoCert label that will appear on ingredients to describe origin of materials or ingredients or the way that that, uh, that product has been made. When we turn up um, and we have this conversation about, look, we've done this ISO 14040 life cycle study that shows our environmental impact is 50% less than the petroleum product we're trying to substitute, that scientifically backed is a good thing for humanity. But we don't have certifications that are used to talking about that type of change. And we encounter a certification that would say, um, we are the voice of natural when it comes to products. And because you use a genetically modified microorganism to make your wonderfully reducing CO2 impact process, we cannot give you our label or our endorsement. Now that is okay, because that's what that brand stands for. It's problematic when you then go to our customers and they say, we have little incentive to invest in the change from our current product, which is petroleum-based, 
is horrible to the environment and horrible to the people that work with it to change over to your naturally sourced sustainable process because we won't get the economic benefit by labeling because we will no longer be able to or we cannot put a label on that the consumer recognizes. So do we encounter issues as you raise, Jen? Well, no, because we'll have compelling conversations with our customers and we'll find any reasons to sell. Would there be benefit from having them be able to translate our story into their label somehow and have certifications, trusted certifications get behind that? Yes, I think there would be benefit because there would be incentive for them to change. So how do we change? Well, we turn up to have conversations with these certifying bodies and we try and tell them this is the science that's behind it. And it's not just Chinamatica. There's a wave of industrial biotechnology companies coming to the table bringing a range of different solutions. And we know there's customers out there that want it because it's a chance to make quite broad, sustainable impact within their product lines. And then hopefully that voice becomes loud enough certifying bodies will start to make that, uh, that jump and that transition and kind of change their perspective on a particular part of perhaps the scientific principle. We ran into a very similar issue where uh, we're using inputs. We'll say there's three different inputs for, for this product and all three of them are approved uh, in other Cosmo certified ingredients. But the way that we put them together yields an inky name Mm -hmm. which gets a uh, tick box uh, on, on the Cosmos for unapproved. <laughs> it, it, it's perplexing, you know, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, when I look at these certifications, I mentioned this at the beginning, that they seem to be based on fallacies. And the big one is that natural and especially organic with the few that I brought up will be better. And they also make statements about they take the precautionary principle depending on the certification that you're looking at. And that is like if you actually look at the research behind some of the ingredients that they don't allow, that is just absolutely not the case. Uh, they very clearly have a preference for natural and I'll give you an example. So uh, rose essential oil has isoeugenol, which is a known toxicant. Find a certification that doesn't allow that ingredient in it. I mean, it, it's not there, but then how many uh, certifications will not approve a product for using parabens? And if you're not aware, they are in fact demonstrably safe. There are a lot of, there's a lot of evidence to suggest this and very little to suggest otherwise. A lot of people will bring up uh, retracted studies. And so obviously that's not good enough. So. I don't buy it, that they're taking the precautionary principle, but um, I guess I might have given my thoughts to your next question, Barry. <laughs> uh, but um, our current eco or quote unquote clean certifications, uh, the information sources, are they good for consumers? Uh, are they reliable? What do you think about them? And maybe also databases can also be yeah. included there. Well, uh, one of the challenges out there right now is that consumers want information. And we as an industry do a terrible job of giving them that information. Uh, if a consumer is going to Google right now and they want to look up a cosmetic ingredient, the first thing that comes up is not a supplier of that ingredient who would have information about it that they might want to share. First thing is not the CIR and safety information. The first thing that comes up is the environmental working group. Do it yourself. Go to Google, look up some <laughs> chemical you sell. Why are they coming up? Because they're filled with uh, people that know about search engine optimization and they know about uh, uh, marketing themselves as experts in the industry in a way that we're not good at. And we as an industry need to get better at that. It wouldn't be hard to outrank them for the chemical that you sell. And in that, that way, now this isn't just a problem with chemicals either. If you put sunscreen, the word sunscreen, they come up first for that, and they come up ahead of the FDA about sunscreens, which to me is a terrible thing. But they're good at it, and they're providing, uh, consumers have this need for information, and they want it in, you know, in a grade school kind of just feed it to me way where give me a number so I can say, is it safe? Oh, it says one, it's safe. It's a 10, it's not safe. And 
you know, the reality reality is that you can't give chemicals numbers to say whether they're safe. Everything is both safe in a low enough level and dangerous in a high enough level. Water, where would you put water on that? You know, people die of water all the time by drowning. <laughs> so, you know, the, just the, the entire ranking of uh, whether an ingredient is safe or not by some simple number is very appealing to consumers. They want something like that. And, you know, hats off to the EWG for coming up with a system that is popular, but it is misleading consumers. And, and, and that's a problem. And if you just look at the accuracy of the information, it's, it's not put together by scientists. They'll give a different ranking for something like sodium lauryl sulfate versus sodium cocal sulfate, when we all know that they're essentially they're the same ingredient. Um, they also have a bias on their system uh, where if you have no data, then you're safe. If we find data and we know a ranking, then you're, you're, you're less safe. So the more we know, the less safe you are. So <laughs> this, is, this is really a problem. Uh, another problem with these standards is that they're kind of in the business of making money. And I remember when I was when I first did a talk about the Cosmos standards, um, they didn't allow sulfates. They didn't allow sodium lauryl sulfate specifically. Two years later, now they allow sodium lauryl sulfate. Well, sodium lauryl sulfate hasn't gotten any safer or less or more. You know, nothing's changed about sodium lauryl sulfate. But uh, you know, Cosmos wasn't approving enough ingredients, and so they said, "Well, this one comes from coconut. So if it comes from coconut, then it's it's okay. Now it's natural." And then, so they over over time, they are loosening their standards. Pretty soon, parabens are going to come back in. Don't you worry about it. Um, so and, and finally, the, the other problem that they have is that there is a conflict of interest here. Revlon just teamed up with the Environmental Working Group and they, got, uh, they launched a product that was certified EWG. Um, so first of all, I say to Revlon, you, what, your, your regulatory people aren't good enough to say that your products are safety? <laughs> what, do you need a, a group that's uh, not, not science-based to certify that, yeah, these are safe. Uh, we are not, we're not using science to decide it's safe, um, but we're going to say it's safe. Um, it, but the EWG, how, how can they take Revlon's money and then say, oh, that, that's safe? And so there's a conflict of interest there, and it's not in the consumer's uh, best hope. So th there's, there's a variety of problems with this, but ultimately, the problem is that industry isn't publishing stuff to offset that, and uh, I don't know how we do that, because uh, what we have as an industry, we, we kind of fight ourselves. We're, I mean, we all love each other, but uh, you know, <laughs> we want to sell more than the next guy. We do. <laughs> there are certain, there are lots of marketers of cosmetic products that benefit from misinformation, and that's a real challenge for the industry as a whole. I love the way you didn't pull a punch though on, <laughs> on calling certifications out for kind of their for-profit approach to sharing on information because you know then almost the common good is somewhat taken out of the uh, out of the equation. Uh, ISO came out with the ISO 16128 standard that we've seen some of the larger companies we talk to embrace quite uh, quite enthusiastically because its ability to uh, address a broad range of products as as natural or naturally sourced depending on the index, and it's self-assert though, but it's also not a profit-generating machine for an external agency. So I wonder if we, if we prefer the self-assertion as an industry, um, or if we want some third party that will make profit from that certification to be the governor of what we consider to be natural or otherwise. I, th I think uh, that would be better. Uh, you know, people don't like government solutions, but in a case where you want an independent group, you know, I think it's, it's tough to say government's not more independent than a profit-driven uh, certifying body. Mm -hmm. And Dennis, you and I had a conversation about this earlier this week that so I'll just use Palm as an example that our industry is really quick right now to remove Palm and switch to coconut. And then you were mentioning that you had a conversation with a manufacturer that they hadn't thought to look into the sustainability profile of coconut. And so it just so happens Palm 
is one of the most resource uh, efficient crops that we have and palm or coconut is less so. So we're switching the problem from one thing that's very efficient to another thing that is less efficient. One thing we know a lot more about, the next thing we don't know as much about, I think we should be critical of it. I'm not going to say that one thing is better and one thing is worse, but we need to be critical of the things that we're switching to and not just making an assumption because we don't have information about it, that it's going to be a better option or that it's natural and it's going to be better than uh, synthetic. So I think it's really important for consumers and industry to be, to be very, very critical of that if we actually want our products to be more sustainable. Yeah, palm is the sort of thing that it's really easy to spin it either way. It takes a very small amount of land use to produce a very large amount of the nut oil. And uh, uh, the producers are very good at kind of utilizing every piece and uh, all portions to, uh, to drive you know, the process and uh, give us you know, the stuff that comes out of it. Palm provides something like a third of uh, the world's nut oil on less than like 1% of the land uh, that's used for agriculture. Uh, but, you know, on the other side of that is, it's incredibly devastating to that 10% of the, uh, the land in, in that part, part of the world. So, uh, like I said, it's, it's very easy to, to look at only one part of it and say it's great, or only look at the other part and say demon, but, you know, really it, it's kind of uh, both together, you know, at, at the same time. Uh, and um, we do need to, to kind of, you know, Assessing sustainability is incredibly hard, incredibly hard, and uh, it's a, it's uh, easy to go, you know, with some sort of gut instinct about, you know, what's going to be more sustainable. This feels right as a, a sustainable alternative. Sometimes that's not always the case. So um, I was going to go somewhere else with the poem, but I lost it. So. <laughs> Sorry. And now I didn't bring this up earlier when I was talking about misinformation, but I think it's a really important point. I'm sorry for talking so much as a moderator, but have you heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Raise your hand if you have. A few, just a few. Okay, so I'll just give an example from my perspective. When I was in first year university, I went into university thinking that I knew everything about biology, what I was originally studying. And then as I went through university, then I started to realize, oh crap, I don't know that much. And then at the end of it, I knew a little bit more than like maybe second and third year, but I was still less confident originally. And I was kind of like, oh, well, it's complicated and oh crap, there's so much more to know. And I think that's the position that a lot of scientists are at. And the people, unfortunately, that are getting the most attention right now, because oftentimes when you know the uh, least, you're, you tend to be a bit more confident with your knowledge as well. <laughs> so those people are, I mean, probably better on camera because they're very confident <laughs> and so right now they're getting a lot of media attention and so there is a documentary right now that I just had Valerie George in front row uh, also a co-host with uh, the Beauty Brains uh, Perry we had a review about this documentary and they had so much media attention in Canada where I'm from and it's alarming because nobody went to check the credentials of the people that put together this film because they were not equipped to put the information out and the mis the information was misinformation which please go listen to the podcast and share it but I think that's a really big challenge because the wrong people right now are getting a platform Form, and the scientists often stay behind closed doors. I don't honestly know another green beauty event that brings scientists together to have this conversation to consumers. So often when I see these conversations, it's with brands. And I've already said this, most brand founders are consumers themselves. And if they're not, oftentimes they have scientists that are behind their brand putting it together. So I think more scientists need to come up behind closed doors and have these conversations. I think that's really important for us to actually move forward as an industry. Does anyone else? I just, I remember what I was thinking about with the palm, and I think it's really important to this conversation. 
so we all agree that you know burning fossil fuels is bad, uh, bad for the environment. We want to reduce that. Uh, one of the things that's been done to assist with that is biodiesel, uh, mixing in you know biodiesel uh, to to do that. So um, the biological input for biodiesel is palm oil. Um, Another thing, uh, we were partially hydrogenating vegetable oils for uh, you know, so that we could uh, possibly believe that it might be butter. Um, but um, we uh, decided that that maybe wasn't the best approach. Trans fats, not very healthsome, uh, potential uh, detrimental health risks. Uh, so then we wanted to get out of uh, trans fats. So what did we uh, uh, do to replace trans fats? Well, all one. You know, uh, the surfactants industry uses, uh, in some cases, the uh, palm kernel oil. Uh, palm kernels are basically a byproduct in, in the production of palm oil. Uh, and so uh, you could think of it as an upcycled ingredient uh, that's uh, producing your uh, uh, some surfactants. So there, again, there's a lot of ways to, to spin it. There's a lot of ways where we think we're doing the right thing to, to increase the sustainability, um, but um, sometimes we're not always cognizant or thinking about the downstream effects. I just want to add to what you said before. I think it is really important for consumers to consider where they are getting their information. I always think back to like, you know, the anti-vaxxer movement. Well, who's really leading that movement? It's a bunch of like mommy bloggers. And so if you're getting your information from a mom blogger and they're making money off of you looking at their page and buying products that they recommend, you should really consider whether that information is there to benefit you or to benefit them. So I think it is important to consider scientists as experts. And if they are sharing information with you, most of the time, that's not their day job. They're working in QAQC. Um, for example, I, I do have a YouTube channel where I share information, but that's not the way I make my living. I just do it because I think it's really fun and it's really cool. So I think it's important to think about what people are getting out of actually sharing information with you and what their true intentions are and how that's financially benefiting them. That does go back to even the certifications, like those certifying bodies are making good money off of that label having some kind of significance to you. So there's like USDA Organic, there's so many reasons why organic is not good, but they've made such an impact in the food and the cosmetics industry that if you see that on a label, it sells to a huge percentage of the consumer base, then it's really powerful. So I think it's just something to consider as a consumer. You do get to decide how you get your information, what you do with that information. So just, you know, take the power back into your hands and listen to people that you trust. And yeah, that's that. great. Yeah, that's a really great message. I'd add two things in science are really, really important. One is to acknowledge that anecdotes is not science, but anecdotes are not science. Um, and all good science is peer reviewed. Right, so single source with interest is not good science, but scientists know that the best science comes from other people looking at your work and reproducing it or providing commentary or building upon it or just helping to endorse that uh, this is not coming from a single, a single and sole source of information. Could I add to that? Um, I think one big issue with you know, science distribution is you know, the peer-reviewed process is great, but then it's like that $50 to view charge for access to all these articles, which like we assume people won't understand, you know, I think unfairly because I think we do a disservice to the public not sharing the work that was funded by, you know, public money with the public. And I think the move toward open access is good, but then even on the science perspective, we like have to pay to have things open access. So it's kind of this like weird enigma of like, where do you go from there and how do you share information? I think some more people are getting into like providing summaries to like media outlets and things like that. But even sometimes people will try to summarize what's in an article. And if they're not, you know, part of the team that authored it, it could have some, you know, suggestions at the end or conclusions that maybe the author wasn't making or it doesn't include any of like the assumptions and things like that that went into the study. So I think it gets really iffy and I've seen even in the science community people recommending, you know, check out the EWG and, you know, go to that website for information and I think 
part of it is, you know, academia is very high pressure. It's very publish or perish. So I think people maybe don't have the time. So they're like, I'll just, you know, send people to the EWG. It'll be fine. But they don't realize how bad it is. Um, and I also think there's some aspect of distrust, distrust from the public with some um, <laughs> studies. So if you look at the FDA and how they've handled BPA as a chemical, um, you can see why the public doesn't trust the FDA in a lot of ways. I definitely do because of you know the mounting body of evidence against the use of BPA and their continuance to use it despite that and their very flawed studies that they've done on their own to um, kind of just continue using it. So I think there's a lot of complexities, but even like the regulatory bod bodies need to be better about talking to the public and also working better with scientists. And so I'll just skip forward to my last question, and I'm sorry I didn't provide it, but I usually ask this at the end of all my podcasts, which this conversation is being recorded as a podcast. So what are your final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? And also, you can just tie this in. Do you have any suggestions for our, our industry to do better from a sustainability perspective? Kenna, would you like to start? Absolutely. I think the biggest thing to take away is that we need to be very open-minded about what sustainability is going to look like in the future. I think we can probably all agree right now the world in this industry is not operating in the most sustainable way, so it can't continue as it is right now. Um, there's a really good quote, I forget who it's by, but it's, if you cannot continue as you are right now, like continue as you never have before. And I think that's really important to think about as we shift and change um, and hopefully for the better, that sustainability is not gonna look like what our products have looked like and felt like and you know, everything that we know about this industry might have to shift a little bit and change. So I think it's important to be open-minded. Um, another takeaway that I'd like you guys to consider is to lose the fear aspect surrounding things like chemicals and uh, genetically modified organisms and even science as a whole. I think that people that are not in the science field um, really view science as this kind of scary thing that's out to kind of get you or I don't know. <laughs> I think it's important to kind of drop the fear factor and really look at those facts. And if you don't understand, um, you know, a study or if you don't understand the full perspective of a topic, then there's a lot of people online that you can reach out to that are qualified or even within your network and circle, you probably know someone that can dissect a topic further and have these conversations with. I think taking everything at face value that we see online um, can be quite dangerous and approaching every product with this kind of fear factor that, you know, I want it to be free from sulfates, free from parabens, free from this and that, and that's going to make your life better in some ways is actually harmful for moving the industry forward in a sustainable way. And then lastly, I would just like to leave it to you guys to really take the power into your hand as people that are part of industry and consumers and consider sustainability as a very, very complex issue that is probably not you know, a one solution answer. So it's always gonna be a changing kind of landscape and um, yeah, just to consider it as a, something that's always gonna be complex and something that we face with and we're never gonna reach a sustainable society. I don't really believe in that. We're just gonna be moving towards being more sustainable and that's kind of the best we can do. Wait, what, you provided questions in advance to this? <laughs> Sorry, Christine. You did, yes, I, I did hear that. Um, so You're maybe not it's, running for president. So. <laughs> That's not my birth certificate. <laughs> um, I, I guess my, my parting message is more a reflection of my time spent up here on stage you know, listen to Kenna's knowledge of products and kind of hear how Perry talks about formulation and some of the issues around that. And I'm still trying to convince Colonial Chemical to start buying sustainable butylene glycol. We're totally and I told you I'd call you out on that. Um, <laughs> we are evaluating. And, and you know, Laura, I'd love to talk to you more about sort of packaging because another part of Genomatica's business is in packaging. 
um, not just in ingredients. So my take home from this and perhaps what I want to share out to all of you is that this irresistible transition that's kind of fueling this really interesting conversation we have up here requires many hands. And if I can sit up here and kind of listen to people sitting around me and have follow-on conversations that I want, I think that's what helps us fuel transition. It helps kind of break down the barriers to change because we are helping one another out, whether it be through ideas or connections or support or encouragement. True change, challenging change, I think is best enabled when we do it together. And so I encourage cooperation. Yeah, I don't know if I have a take home message um, as you work, if you work in industry, your hands are a little bit tied. Uh, we, let's, let's face it, marketing is what runs our industry and uh, the marketing message sometimes is going to conflict with the science. Uh, with reality and you in the lab can't say you know my marketer wants to say this but this is what's real you can't go against your brand uh, and that's that's just the reality uh, fortunately there are some people that are independent of companies and they can go out there and, and say these things but uh, uh, as far as sustainability goes I, I think it is a, a, a great goal for the industry to find a way to stop using petroleum, um, but we also shouldn't feel so guilty about what we're doing right now, because if you look at our impact, the industry's impact, compared to the impact of other industries, uh, automobile, uh, air, air travel, um, we, are, we are puny in comparison, and we get so much more flack uh, and attacking us uh, so much more. I, I look here in California, you got uh, CARB and you, thank you, you've totally ruined hairsprays. <laughs> hairsprays are terrible now. Um, and have you really helped, uh, have you helped the pollution? Because uh, you haven't done much about the cars where there is a real impact. And, and I understand the, the cosmetic industry, if we can uh, be more sustainable, we should move that way And because we can't stay uh, on petroleum, but uh, there are bigger fish to fry. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, when it comes to the, you know, the beauty industry, obviously, it's they're, they're vanity products and nobody wants to feel like their vanity product is destroying the environment when they use it. Um, but the thing is that we've got to be real careful about, you know, first making sure that we're doing a good job at measuring, you know, sustainability. And it's like Kenneth said, it's very hard to do. And so we have to come to grips with that. And we have to not necessarily go with, you know, some gut feeling about uh, what's going to be a more sustainable solution. Uh, because when it comes to these sorts of big numbers and statistics and all the rest of it, your gut instincts are wrong 90% of the time. You know, our brains aren't designed to work with these sorts of, uh, of numbers uh, or, you know, how these things interact. You know, it's not instinctual at all. And uh, in terms of, you know, product safety, we just have to make sure that we're leading with the positive uh, with the products, not, you know, uh, always saying, you know, free from this, free from that, uh, based on, in sometimes, uh, you know, shaky science or no science at all, just some sort of, again, you know, emotional feel that this shouldn't be part of the product. Uh, we really need to, to do a better job at like communicating, again, ingredient safety, product safety. We all uh, share in that and uh, make sure that uh, folks understand, again, that uh, our products are, you know, by and large safe. If as we move towards sustainability, you know, we can work on some of these other things. Um, I'd say I have probably three big ones, but I'm sure I'll forget one. Um, <laughs> greenwashing is everywhere, so definitely try to think more like holistically about, you know, the products that you buy and also, you know, how many you need because the best way to be more sustainable is actually to buy less, um, not to disrupt any industries here. <laughs> um, uh, another big one would be to be open to being proved wrong. So I'm wrong just constantly in science and you know that's part of the job. It's you know 
failure is, you know, right around the corner, especially with experiments. And I think it's uncomfortable to be wrong a lot of the times, but like I've gotten used to it. And I think, you know, the idea of having an opinion, but then alter that based on new evidence and make sure that that evidence is credible and that you should trust it. Um, and another one is to, as you know better, do better. And, you know, that's all we can really hope to do as consumers. Um, but yeah. Well, this was the panel discussion. We thank you so much for being a part of it tonight for the first event in LA. And just one note, if you find this conversation important, if you're passionate about science-based green beauty, my goal with this event is to bring science back into the conversation because currently it's just not there. When I talk to other industry members that's like, oh, I have a business about green beauty, they just roll their eyes at me because it's just a bunch of fluff because largely it is. So if you want to bring more science into this conversation, then, I mean, follow scientists, of course, share what they have to say, but, I mean, for this conversation, and if you value this conversation, please share it. So the ultimate goal is to make, uh, I mean, ripples through the industry so that the industry can start to change the dialogue because I personally, and I hope you do as well, think that it's really important.